Hello again. The Practical Animal Channel is dedicated to the public understanding of conservation by showcasing what conservationists do. These are their stories. Today's guest is an expert on cheetahs. Dion Siliers is field officer for the South Africa-based Cheetah Outreach Trust. He works on livestock predation prevention with free roaming wild cheetahs. If studying cheetah conservation interests you, then listen until the end for research project ideas. I began by asking him what his job involves. You work with cheetahs. What does the job involve? John, the work entails the conservation of cheetahs, but we mainly work with the farming community to try and change their tolerance levels towards cheetahs that occur on the farming areas. What are the goals of the Cheetah Outreach Trust, Dion? The goals of the trust is to conserve the free-roaming cheetahs that still occur in South Africa. Dion, I imagine that no two days are the same. And if that is the case, could you give me a sense of what a typical week might be like? Yeah, our, our work is not a work that can be planned. We always have a type of a plan on the table. You might plan to be going out to go and check camera traps um, or to go and check on some of the livestock guarding dog puppies that we've placed. But everything can be changed in a minute with a call from a farmer that has got a, a cheetah on his property that is causing him problems. You have to think on your feet. Um, and you have to come up with workable solutions in situations that have never existed before. Um, every situation is unique. Every farm has got its unique problems. And you've got to be able to adapt. So this is what makes a life very interesting. You might be thinking that you're tracking a cheetah or you've got a cheetah that, that is causing problems. And you arrive on the farm and it actually turns out to either be a leopard or a hyena or a brown or a spotted hyena or even a serval that the, the farmer has actually mistakenly identified as a cheetah. It's all about conflict mitigation. It's all about putting practical solutions, understanding the, the viewpoint of the farmer, and trying to adapt your solution to actually fit into his farming practice. Because farmers are not going to change their farming practices to fit into a conservation strategy. You need to be able to adapt and to adapt your approach to fit into the these specific, unique circumstances on their farms. Can you give me a sense, Dion, of, of how you need to, to approach and speak with farmers that have a problem that you're meeting with for the first time? I presume you need to be polite, but do you also need to have a farming background yourself? Don't know. I've got a conservation background. I have a degree in conservation. I've been involved with the farming community for over 33 years. I always joke, I say, I'm, I'm not a conservationist, I'm a farmer psychologist, I know the way they, they hit stick, and that's how you approach them. I mean, you cannot, well, barge into a, a guy's house and preach to him and threaten to him and tell him, if you don't do this, you will be taking him to this, this court and you will be prosecuting him. You've lost that guy completely. So you approach a farmer with a lot of respect, with a lot of sympathy towards his problem. A farmer that's got a problem with predators and actually approaches you as a conservationist actually wants to do the right thing. And just by being sympathetic and giving a listening ear to them and giving them the first half an hour to actually tell, tell you what they want to. I always jokingly say that I allow them to vomit on me for 30 minutes. And after that 30 minutes has been done and he's got all his He's built up anger out of him. You can start working with him and suggesting certain solutions that during the first half an hour that you've actually read the guy's way of thinking, you can actually adapt your way of, of suggesting certain stuff to him. And we've been very successful. That's what a lot of the conservation organizations that work with farming communities 
do not do correctly. They come up with, you will do this, and if you don't do this, I will do this to you. That's the wrong way to approach a farmer. We usually give him a few points of suggestions of what he can do with our assistance to actually solve his, his predation problem um, or his tolerance problem, because a lot of times it's just misunderstanding. Um, they don't know the facts. They don't know the way animals actually move across their properties. So we just give them as many facts as we can based on real-time scientific information. Um, we give them suggestions as is livestock garden dogs or let's upgrade your fences or let's collar a cheetah and see what he's doing. And then you plant that seed and you leave it with him. If he doesn't agree at that moment, there's no use of just forcing it onto him. Change the subject, speak, speak to him about his farming practices, find out how his kids are, um, and leave it, the suggestions there. And guaranteed within a week that guy will come back and he says, but he's thought about this, and he thinks point A, B, and C can work on his farm, but point D is not going to work. Let's start with point B. Um, and that gives you a foot in the door to actually start with your conservation work and informal education to this guy to actually get him informed of what cheaters do in the area and what can be done to solve his specific issue on his farm. Dion, how can camera traps help the work? Look, the camera traps that we put out is basically there to identify the movement of cheaters throughout the area and also to get an idea of the density of cheaters and other predators that occur in that specific farming area. So by putting out camera traps, we can get specific photos of the cheaters and leopards and hyenas that actually move across the farm. And we can identify specific individuals by looking at spot patterns and the bands on the brown hyenas feet and stuff. And by doing that and showing the farmer the photos and saying, okay, we've got 20 photos of 20 different cheaters according to you. But let's just look at the spot patterns of those cheaters. And by doing that, we can actually prove to the farmer with him seeing the photos that there's actually one or two cheaters that move across his farm. And it's not a whole troop of cheaters as many as him think. It's sharing scientific knowledge taken with his cooperation on his farm in real time with him to change his attitude. How important is it to be able to identify individual cheaters on the camera traps? Bill? It's, it's very important to do it um, because if you can identify the individuals, um, you know how many animals are in the in the area. It's not difficult to identify these these cheetahs. Um, cheetahs, each cheetah has got a unique spot pattern. Basically, take one specific area of their cheetah. For instance, the left hind quarter, and you focus on a specific area with specific pattern uh, spot patterns, and you use that specific area for all the cheetahs that you identify in that area. We've got two camera traps per per setup, so. You actually force the animal to move between the two camera trips. So mm. you're going to get a left side and you're going to get a right side. Mm. And you can then take it back to time and date, which makes it easy to identify that specific individual. Uh, when you have to trap a cheetah, Dion, does the organization that you work for, the Cheetah Outreach Trust, make the traps or do you have to buy them in commercially made or how does that work? No, no, we, we have to buy commercial commercially made traps made to catch cheetahs. Uh, you get trap cages with one sliding door and you get trap cages with two sliding doors. To catch cheetahs, you need a trap that's open on both sides. Um, so you need a trap with, with two sliding doors that you can actually see through and walk through. We do put the traps up at scent marking trees because cheetahs come back to scent marking trees. It's a local communication hub. So all the cheetahs in that area come to that central communication hub to urinate against it, leave their scats there, and to leave the message that I'm around. Um, so males use the, the scent marking trees very often. The females only approach the scent marking trees when they are in season to actually send the message out that I'm available, cheetah female, I am in the area, see if you can find me. What are the local attitudes towards free roaming cheetahs? John, it, it really depends on the specific area. We've seen that in areas where we are actively involved, and we're working hand in hand with the farmers, the attitudes change from being negative towards being positive. But the, the entire area that we work on is approximately 12 million hectares. We recently, we are busy with a, a free roaming cheetah census project at this stage to do a census across the entire distribution range of cheetahs. And one of the questions we ask is to actually um, look at the tolerance levels of farmers. And 
preliminary results at this stage is that there's about a 39% intolerant level towards cheetahs from some of the farmers, and about a 48% quite positive reaction towards the presence on, on the farming areas. Farmers are actually conservationists at heart as well. And if you can explain what the, the issues are and give them workable solutions that they can actually identify with, they can actually tolerate these animals and they don't have to kill and get rid of them. They can live and coexist with them. Dion, what is the natural range of the cheetah? Is it from South Africa up to Saudi? Basically, it's from the northern parts of South Africa into Egypt. Um, they do occur, but they occur at very low numbers and populations and very spatially fragmented. The, South Afri well, the southern African population at this stage is the most connected population and with the most individuals as well. So we estimate that the there's, there's a, around 3,600 cheetahs in Southern Africa, taking a total population of around 6,800 uh, 6, individuals. The rest are all in small fragmented populations going up north right into Northern Africa. Um, but the main hub of the cheetahs are in Southern Africa, but we estimate that the South African population to be around 400 to 600 individuals still free roaming on, on farmland areas. But Swana, they're looking at about 1,500, maybe about 1,000 to 1,500. In Zimbabwe, the population has been decimated. There's not many cheetahs left in Zimbabwe, but there are small fragmented populations there. So taking individual countries uh, across the whole of the continent of Africa, many of the populations within those countries uh, will be classed as critically endangered, I'm guessing. Now, the cheetah is is classified not as endangered, but as vulnerable. Uh, what are the threats to you? It's human conflict, um, because cheetahs do need to eat meat, and a lot of times they do predate on livestock. That just causes intolerance, and because a lot of these areas are quite vast and away from, from central hubs where people can assist them, the farmers, especially the communal farmers up in Africa, take matters in own hands, and they either kill them um, with dogs or just kill them in snares or poison or stuff like that. But there are various projects across Africa looking at cheetahs. Um, we focus basically just on South Africa, but we work very, work very closely with our neighboring countries in Botswana and Zimbabwe and Namibia to implement the same strategies to make sure that the same um, conservation strategies are implemented in various co neighboring countries to ensure that one farmer on this side of the border doesn't have a different solution than the guy on the other side of the border. Um, so it's a blanket solution we're giving to the Southern African population, working hand in hand with our sister organizations across the borders. What diseases do cheetahs face the on in the wild? The free roaming cheetah population is quite healthy. Is it easy to get uh, vets to accompany you in the field for blood sampling and other routine tests? Now, the short answer is no, it's not very easy to get vets to get out. Um, the services of veterinarians are, are quite expensive. Um, but if we do have a cheetah in a trap cage, um, we have been trained up to be able to take blood samples. Um, if the cat needs medical assistance, we've got our own transport boxes that we can load the animal and get him to an experienced vet as soon as possible. Um, there are a lot of veterinarians working throughout the range, but not all of them are experienced working with big cats or with specifically with cheetahs. So we've got a, a core group of experienced vets that are very well known to us, and they offer their services close to free of charge for us to actually assist these cheetahs because they know it is a vulnerable conservation species. Leon, how would you describe cheetah conservation today? 90% of these cheetahs that still occur in Africa occur in areas where they are not really welcome. So conservation projects focus on research, they focus on, on conflict mitigation um, with the main aim to conserve these cheetahs on farmland areas. We are quite positive that the cheetah conservation groups are making a huge impact on cheetah conservation on farmland areas in Africa to actually sustain and conserve these last free roaming cheetahs for future generations. How do you see the cheetah conservation scene changing over the next 10 years, Dion? Although we are specifically focusing on animal species, 
I think it's going to be changing not towards the animal species, but towards habitat conservation to ensure the safety of habitat, securing habitat, where cheetahs and other species that are threatened as well can coexist in harmony with those farming communities. Ion, what is the habitat of the cheetah in South Africa? It varies from open grassland areas to thickly wooded areas. Um, but studies have proven that the densities of cheetahs are actually much higher in the wooded areas than they are in the grassland areas. So yeah, they occur from high mountain areas right down to very low areas, open areas. They do not occur in densely forested areas. Um, that's, that's just impossible then for them to survive there. Um, but in densely wooded areas, densely savanna wooded areas, they do exceptionally well. We've had situations where I, I actually was flying with a, a micro light aircraft above a group of, of five cheetahs, um, and they were hunting in a typical African wild dog manner, where they would, one would chase the, the prey animal. As soon as that cheetah would get tired, he would fall back and the next one would come, and they would tire that, that prey animal out until it actually dropped. Um, so they would actually make turn. It was not this this typical 100 kilometer hour sprint of a cheetah chasing a, an antelope. It was basically just wearing the animal down. So they adapt very well to the environment. I just wonder, Dion, as, as assuming that there's total success with the conservation of the cheetah, has anybody done a, an estimation of the carrying capacity for cheetahs in the habitats of South Africa? We have, for instance, put telemetry collars on cheetahs, satellite collars, to actually determine their, their movement and home ranges. This has also been done in the conservation areas in South Africa. Um, and just by collaring these free-roaming cheetahs, it's just become more and more clear that the conservation areas in South Africa where cheetahs occur are just too small to sustain genetically viable populations because these animals need, need huge areas. The average ranges of cheetahs at this stage, we've got a female with cubs. She uses approximately 40,000 hectares um, as her range. A single female that we call it used up to 900,000 hectares. We had coalitions of males using up to 1.2 million hectares. So it, these are huge areas and we don't have a, a lot of conservation areas that can actually sustain these movements. So to, to determine carrying capacity is going to be very, very difficult. But cheetahs do occur in low numbers. And by doing the density studies, by doing the camera trapping, by doing the collaring, and by continuing this for a lot of a, a few years, we can actually start picking up densities, whether these pop populations are increasing or decreasing. And if they are decreasing, it gives us a reason to, to go and do further research to see why are they decreasing from a number that they were actually at, at five years ago. So it's not a, a one-time project, this. We've been doing the, the cheetah conservation project at Cheetah Outreach since 2005. Um, and we still, still do not have enough information to actually say, yes, this is the carrying capacity, this is the range um, use, and this is the impact that these animals are having on farmland areas because it, it changes the whole time. It's a constant changing environment. But you work a lot with Anatolian sheepdogs, don't you? Yes. We do use the, the Anatolian shepherd dogs as a livestock guarding dog, a livestock mitigation um, tool. Um, there are other organizations in Southern Africa that also use the dogs. Um, for instance, in Namibia, they actually started with the livestock guarding dog project in Namibia. Um, instead of redesigning the wheel, we just fine-tuned it for the South African environment. Um, up to date, we have placed around 380 livestock guarding dogs with farmers to actually manage their predation issues. Um, we've got about an 84% success rate with the placement of the dogs. Sometimes some of these puppies just don't want to bond with the livestock. They want to be with humans, and then we don't force them to bond because that just causes problems. Um, but in general, 84% success rate is not bad at all. We visit our, our placements for the first 12 months on a monthly basis to make sure that the dogs adapt very well, that the farmer understands the way the dog operates, because that's the main issue. We don't need to, to teach the dog how to guard livestock. It's an inbred thing over thousands of years. 
It's a, they do it instinctively. So we advise on a constant basis. And that just gives the farmer the perception that these guys don't drop a solution on us. They actually take hands with us and we become partners in his farming practice to so solve his predation issue. So that's why the dogs are very successful. The animals or the predators in the farmland areas include animals like leopards. They include cheetahs. They include brown hyenas, sometimes spotted hyenas, sometimes African wild dogs. So you do need a large dog to actually stand his ground. And that's why the Anatolian is so, so successful as well. That term, predation management, that kind of encapsulates what you're trying to do, doesn't it? That's right. We, we're not trying to manage the predators because that is an impossible task. But you can effectively manage your predation risk. Something else we use for predation risk, for instance, is the use of bio-boundaries, which is a natural way to actually get predators to stay away out of a specific area. Um, so we use stuff like lion scats or leopard scats for cheetahs. And the smell of that big cat alone actually keeps the animals away or the predators away from that specific area. What are the skills and personal qualities needed to work with cheetahs, Anatolian shepherd dogs and farmers? Yeah, I think you need different skills to work with each one of those. I mean, you really need a love of predators and the understanding of science to work with cheetahs. Um, you need to know how they are adapted to the environment and how they fit into the bigger biodiversity picture. Cheetahs occur at very low numbers, so there will never ever be thousands of cheetahs running around. Working with the livestock guardian dogs, you must understand the way the dog thinks and the way that he's been bred over thousands of years to do his job. And then working with the farmers, you must have a sympathetic ear. Dion, can you describe how your own career developed, please? John, I, st I started as a, a government official, a government conservation official, working with farmers as a law enforcement officer, actually. So, yeah, I, I was catching poachers and putting people in jail. It was not keeping up with the, the legislation. But I soon realized that there is a place for it, but that's not the way you're going to change attitudes. Um, and then my, my career changed into that of the, 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 the government department's uh, damage-causing animal office, where I actually assisted farmers with solutions. Um, and then, in reality, government funding start, started to get much less than we needed. And then I moved over to the, the NGO, the non-government organization sector, where we actually started with working with the farmers from a non-government organization point of view which opened up a lot of doors because all of a sudden I was not the guy working for government, but someone that was actually taking the plight of the farmer and what was concerning to him in consideration from an NGO point of view. Um, and that's, I think, had a lot of more success than, than the government guys are having. Leon, which books or people or meetings have most influenced your own thinking about the problems that cheetahs face? My approach and the way that I work was actually initiated by a lady called Anne van Dyke, who actually established the Devolt Cheetah Breeding Center in South Africa. She was the first person globally to successfully breed cheetahs in captivity. If you don't conserve and secure valuable habitat for these animals and secure habitat that cheetahs can coexist with, with human beings, you can breed them until you're pink in the face, you're not gonna be able to save the species. Um, my conservation background, of, I think I can attribute to my, my dad that used to take me out to the Kruger National Park and he laid the foundation for, for conservation there. So it must start at a, at a, at a young age. What, do you, what would you say is an ideal age for people to be exposed to the ideas of conservation of cheetahs? As soon as possible. So Dion, are there actually captive breeding centres for cheetah? But many of these cheetahs are bred for release into conservation areas now. So where these captive animals are taken through a process of rewilding um, to get them successfully hunting, and then they get put into specific conservation areas to supplement the genetics within that, that population. Dion, what does that rewilding process involve? Well, a cheetah is a cat, and a cat is a natural hunter. Um, so you need to put them in an environment which is safe, where there are not many other predators that can compete with them or be a danger to, towards them. 
And where they can hunt on their own pace and learn to hunt on their own pace. And as soon as we see that they are successful hunters, they get collared, they get monitored very closely, and they get released within the larger conservation areas where they get, they for the first year, they are closely monitored. And if there are circumstances where they are under threat of other predators, um, they, they, there can be interventions that can take place to prevent that. But ultimately, we cannot cover these cheetahs in cotton wool and think they're never going to be injured or killed by other predators. This is a natural area. And people must accept the fact that although cheetahs can hunt successfully, they are the lowest of the lowest in the scaling rank of the predators. And animals like leopards and lions are a huge threat towards them. But if we can get those animals through this, the, the events of adapting to stay away from these larger predators, um, that is a, a success for your wilding. Um, and it's been done very successful. Uh, the main threats in the, the, the conservation areas are basically lions and leopards. Um, on the farming areas, we don't have free roaming lions in m many of the areas anymore. So the largest predator there is either the spotted hyenas or the, the leopards. Many of the conservation areas in South Africa, which are fenced, are too small to sustain the populations of cheetahs. If we don't have a meta population project where we actively manage genetics between populations, we're going to run into a genetic nightmare pretty soon. But fortunately, these animals are managed genetically within these reserves. What advice can you offer persons wanting to be volunteers or interns? Yeah, I think the advice that I can give to them is to contact reputable conservation NGOs that are working with these these animals. Um, do your homework. There are quite a few organizations that are, are saying that they are doing conservation work, but it's more about getting the money in from volunteer programs than it is for conservation purposes. Look at the background of the organization before you actively become involved as a volunteer there and make sure that there are conservation deliverables because everybody can say that we're doing conservation, but if there are no hard deliverables, think twice before becoming involved with those organizations. But it is a very exciting field in conservation. It is a very challenging field. And if these young students are open for challenges, this is the way to go. What might make an interesting final year project for uh, conservation interns from America or Britain or any other country? From a free roaming point of view, we need to continue with um, constant sentencing. We need to continue with testing of new predation management techniques. Um, we need to have a look at camera trapping, for instance. We need to have a look at, at prey use of cheetahs, for instance, because farmers have got their own idea, we've got our own idea. Students can analyze methods used by farmers, the success of farmer methods versus livestock guardian dogs, for instance. Um, in the conservation areas as well, look at the threats of other predators towards cheetahs, look at prey use of cheetahs within conservation areas and compare that with cheetahs outside of conservation areas. Cheetahs are yet to stay. I think there's a huge future for cheetahs in Africa and in areas where people are actually doing proactive work, the range of the cheetah is expanding, which is good news. Leon, is there anything that you'd like to add? NGOs such as Chile Outreach are dependent on donations for us to do our work. We are non-profit organizations, and without the support of donors, we will not be able to do the conservation work we do. Um, so it's very important for people to understand the work we do, and if it's something that they can identify, um, they should please support conservation NGOs that are working with farmers working with predators such as cheetahs to ensure the, the conservation and survival of these cheetahs and farmland areas. Dion, thank you very much indeed for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you. It's been very nice to, to chat to you.